Uh, thankful to be here with you guys today. If you don't know me, my name is Eric, and I am the lead pastor here at our Riverdale location of Alpine Church. Uh, I wanted to reveal a little bit of uh, something about me and my family. My wife, by the way, was just singing that last song. And um, a little bit about us is when, when something goes wrong, when we've wronged someone, when we've wronged each other, or when the kids have done something, you know, that needs to be corrected, the way that we make it right with each other is very kind of systematic. We expect a lot out of each other. It's usually um, we've got to come to one another and, and, and not just say sorry, because sorry doesn't cut it. You ever heard that before? <laughs> sorry just doesn't cut it. When are you going to change, right? So, so we hold each other this high expectation that you're going to come, you're going to apologize, but then you're also going to list out why are you sorry? What are the things that you did? Why do you think that this happened this way? You know, maybe even get to the point of, of humility, right? Of humility, like... Uh, admitting that you have a weakness in this area. Now I know that sounds like, geez, I don't want to be, I'm glad I'm not part of their family, you know? Maybe you're like, man, maybe you should be thanking your wife or husband right now, like, thank you for being so gracious. That's just how we are. Um, but a part of the reason why, I think, is because we want to be honest and we want to get the stuff up and out of us that makes us hurt each other, right? We want to, we want to be humble. We want to grow. We want to know the truth about ourselves and let God kind of dig out the, the ugliness in us. And so I think it takes a lot of humility to be able to do that um, and not just say sorry when we do things wrong, but, but make ways to make things right. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. In our sixth week of the pursuit, uh, we're going through this 12-week track on the basics for Christianity uh, using our, our uh, disciple-making website, PursueGod.org. In the sixth week, we're talking about what does it take to get right with God. And we're talking about salvation, getting saved, being forgiven, trusting in Jesus. This is all about what we we're going to talk about today. And so the last two weeks, two weeks ago, we talked about sin and that is the reason why we need to be made right with God. We've gone against him. We've hurt him. We've gone our own way. We've trusted our own opinions and our own feelings, our own ideas, rather than following him. And so therefore, we've sinned against him. And we were also born in this nature that just naturally wants to go away from him. And so we need to be reconciled with God. We need to be saved because if we're not, we're all headed to separation from God. We've talked about that. And then last week we talked about, so what's the solution? How do we, how do we get made right with God? Well, we, ne we need to understand that God provided his son, Jesus Christ, to come down to earth to save us from our sin. And we talked about all of who Jesus is last week. And so if you want to get more into that, I would say, go, go look at our Go look at our lesson from last week, but today we're going to talk about the right way to get saved and have a relationship with God, but I am going to do a little bit of a recap with my first point is this. This is how we're going to get right with God. Out of love, we need to understand that God sent Jesus into the world to solve our sin problem. Now, this is... Um, the basics of Christianity. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we should all know. And as a matter of fact, a lot of you probably know the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, if we break apart this verse, maybe you haven't ever heard this verse uh, expounded upon before. You've just heard it, and basically, that's the gospel. God gave his son that if we believe in him, we'll have eternal life. Um, it, it, it doesn't say it, but it implies that the giving of his son was giving him over as a sacrifice, as the death on the cross. We're going to get into some of that stuff, but even this idea that God gave his son, that's Christmas. That's what we celebrate every single year, that God uh, sent his son to be born in human flesh, to be like us. He becomes a baby in the year zero of our calendars. Um, he becomes a baby, and that's what Christmas is. God gave his son, sent him down to the earth to become like us, flesh and blood. And there's so much in that. The next part of that sentence says 
He gave his one and only son. Now, uh, other translations say only begotten son, but there's a word, the word that, that makes up that part of the sentence, one and only or begotten son, is a word that in the original language has so much meaning to it. It means that he is the preeminent one. He is first in rank. He is the heir of all things. He is the greatest in all of the universe. One and only. You've heard that before. The one, the only. I wish they would say that about me when I came up to preach, but I don't measure up to that at all. He is the one, the only son of God who is God in the flesh. An interesting thing about Jesus, we didn't necessarily cover it last week, but that he is a 100% God, but then at a moment in time, he became 100% man. And on earth, he was both 100% God and 100% man. Now, that's a hard concept to, to wrap our minds around, but the question is, is why? Why did God do it that way? Why did God have to send his son to become a human to come and die. Now I've got a deep, I'm going to get a little bit deep in this first point. I've got something for everybody here. If you're a seeker here today, I want you to understand some basic truths about who Jesus is. If you've been a Christian for a while, I want you to understand it a little deeper. If you've been a Christian for a long time, we're going to get deep, as deep as I can in 26 minutes. But in, in a book, one of the deepest books in the New Testament, in Hebrews, it explains why did Jesus have to become flesh and blood? Why did the Son take on humanity? It says, Hebrews 2.14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death, only in this way, could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying? Now, this is deep. I want you to go, you know, read this whole passage in this whole chapter. But it's saying here that, you know, God, the Son, who was God, could not die. Why? Because he's an eternal spirit being. God has always existed. The Son has always existed. We just sang about the Trinity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, he has always existed, but he had to become flesh and blood so that he could have his flesh broken and his blood spilled out as the sacrifice for humanity. That's the only way he could die was to become human. And the next sentence is so big for us because he, he broke the power of the devil in the fear of death. Did you know that all, all humanity is, lives in slavery to the fear of death is what that's saying. Over the last couple of years, a lot of things have happened. Humans have always been afraid of dying. But just, just you know, the thing that we haven't been talking about lately, you know, COVID and all that has happened, um, things that's been going on in our, our, our minds that we're trying to forget about. But just think about all the frenzies that happened. The, the anger that everybody had towards each other because, you know, you weren't doing the right thing or the wrong thing or you're not listening to the government or you're not wearing a mask or you are wearing a mask. And there was all these these wars and these battles, and a lot of it had to do is because people had fear of their, their safety and their health. And it makes sense for the, for the majority of the world to fear death. Why? Because there's no hope for a person who hasn't trusted in Jesus. There's nothing after this for them that is hopeful. It is only fear. It's scary, okay? And so it makes sense that people live in slavery to the fear of dying. But for Christians, although it is a little bit fearful about what's going to happen if we leave our, our loved ones behind, can they take care of themselves, right? For Christians, it is biblical to have courage in the face of fear, courage in the face of death. Now, I know it's still a hard concept for us to grasp in humanity, because death is not a beautiful thing. It is, it is a, it's a thing that happened because of the fall, because of humanity. Now, all of us one day will pass away. But this is saying that we don't have to live in the fear of dying. We should actually, as Christians, welcome death. When it comes, Paul says, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. He says, it'd be better that I could go and be with the Lord. You know, Revelation, the end of the Bible says, come, Lord Jesus, come. 
We want Jesus to come one day and to make all things new and to get rid of the sickness and the death and the, the sadness, the brokenness of humanity. But this is saying that we can get rid of our fear of death now by faith in Jesus Christ because Christians, we have a hope that surpasses the fear that the majority of the world has to deal with because Jesus died in our place, what we deserved as we go to be um, in front of God at the end of our lives, there will be a judgment. But what will happen for those who trust in Jesus is God will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you've been covered by the blood of Christ, by that sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus, his death on the cross was this great exchange that happened because of that death. Now we can have life. A wonderful verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now this is another deep passage. But what it's basically saying is God made Jesus the one who had never sinned before basically take all the sins of us. He basically became sin, and all of that sin with him was nailed to the cross. And Jesus' perfection and righteousness is now traded for our sin. And so now he gets his sin, and we get his righteousness. That's called the great exchange. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, we now stand before God as righteous. No matter what we've done, we're covered by the blood of Jesus by faith. So the question is, maybe you're here and you're like, man, that's, I, I mean, how do I get this? What is this faith? What does it take? Well, saving faith requires both the right information and the right attitude. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of beliefs out there about who Jesus is, a lot of beliefs in there about how to get to heaven. There's a lot of people who who, who, who would call themselves Christians in, in America, maybe in the entire world, but especially in America, and they would call themselves Christians, but not necessarily, you can't see any fruit coming from their life. You wouldn't be able to tell that they have faith. They've just said, yeah, I believe in, I believe in Jesus. Well, here's something scary about people who, who say that, but don't really live a life following after him. Uh, James 2.19 says this, You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God? Good for you! Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in fear. The demons believe in God. Did you know that? The demons believe in Jesus. They know him more probably, have seen him and understand all of the Trinity and in the realm of heaven, right? Because the demons, as we learned, were kicked out of heaven before things were created. So they know all about Jesus, but it's not just believing. It's not just a mental ascent of understanding that, I, okay, there's a God out there, and he exists, and so that's not what saves us. We have to have the right information, as I've said, and the right attitude. It's, it's faith and repentance. And let me explain that, because it sounds like two different things. Now, Faith and repentance, we believe by faith alone, but faith is a two-sided coin. Faith is a two-sided coin because real faith produces a changed life. And that's really repentance, the word in Greek, okay, because the New Testament was written in Greek, is metanoia. Now, now, it means to change one's mind as a result, their lifestyle would change. To change your mind. Your mind would be changed so much that your heart would change and your life would change. That's what repentance means. If you think about metamorphosis, that, that's the, the word to, to change into something. And then if you think about paranoia, that's, that's like a, a sickness in the mind. Noia means mind. So metanoia means to change your mind. That's what repentance means. So simply put, we believe the right information about we're sinners and that Jesus saves us by his uh, grace through faith alone and that we agree with God that he's right and I'm wrong and my way is sin and his way isn't, right? So it's, that's what saving faith looks like. If I could put it as, as plainly, it says having the right information, the right attitude. We need to understand that we're sinners 
and believe that we're saved by grace through Jesus and that we don't believe that we're going to just go on to live however we want after this, but we, we've made, we're making a commitment to follow after him. Now, in the book of Acts, um, after Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit comes on the believers, it, they're going to go start the church. Now, the church has started. That's the age in which we are in now, right? Churches are taking the message to the ends of the earth. But Peter, after he's filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches his very first sermon, and he's basically, and all the Jewish people around listening to him, and, and what happens is, is that he's basically telling them, you, you killed the Messiah that had been talked about in the Old Testament that was coming to save you this whole time. And he preaches this Holy Spirit-filled message, and it kind of ends like this. So let everyone know in Israel for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said, brothers, what should we do? Now, I think this is a very great example about what a working of God in a person's heart would look like. Hearing the words of God, hearing the good news, the gospel that Jesus came to die for us and it pierces your heart, your emotions, your psyche, your soul in such a way that you say, I need to do something about this. I am torn. I am sad. I am remorseful about who I am and what I've done. That's what repentance looks like. And here's what he says. He says, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want you to get too caught up on the order of how things are going here. Because in the book of Acts, there's something you need to understand when interpreting the book of Acts. It's, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. Meaning, we're not going to pull all our theology out of this historical book of Acts because what was happening was this historical event of the Holy Spirit falling on people for the first time and then only the Jews were getting the message and then it is revealed to the Gentiles later. And so we're not in this same era here. But what he's saying is, is about being baptized and then getting the Holy Spirit is that you should prove that you've changed your, you should prove that you've changed your mind. You should prove that you've turned to God by having an outward confession of your faith, showing people, not just keeping it to yourself, but showing people. That's what baptism is. We've got a couple baptisms, second service. You should come watch it. But we're not saved by baptism. This is an outward act. It's a symbol of our faith. But this is, again, a picture of repentance, true faith causes a person to want to turn around from their life and change and now do new things. There's a, there's a part later in Acts 11:18 that says that it was God that granted them the repentance in the first place. This is very interesting. When, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. There's this is uh, from last week's sermon. Um, Peter had went and preached to Cornelius and his family, and they all got saved. The Holy Spirit fell on them, and then they went to go get baptized. So that's why I'm telling you the order's different in Acts a couple of times. But they got saved, and there was this outward uh, visible um, gift of the Spirit that happened in their lives. But this is why I underlined this, is that God has granted repentance that leads to life. You know, theologians have argued for many years, how does this all work? At what point is a person saved? What do I got to do? What, what's God's part and my part? You know, we're all confused about that. Well, the order of salvation, I believe that we see here is that God gives us this ability to repent in the first place. He comes and softens our heart. The Spirit comes on a person, and by that and that alone, because we're so prideful, we can't see our sin, by God coming on us through the Spirit and waking us up, we're dead, now we're regenerated, and then we're finally able to say, oh, I am a sinner. We can't get there on our own, guys. 
I'm sorry about that, but it's so hard to just admit. Just think about like how hard it is to get, if you have any children here, <laughs> how hard it is to get them to admit they're wrong. Or maybe you have a wife or husband. I'm not saying elbow them or anything like that. But you know how hard it is to admit that you're wrong and that you're a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit. So for us to admit that we've been wrong our, our entire lives and we've done things bad against God and, and gone our own way, uh, we need the Spirit of God to come upon us to say, oh, yes. And then it leads to faith. That leads to justification, which is to be justified before the judge. That's like a legal term. And here's what I want you to understand. We are saved 100% by grace through faith when we trust Jesus for salvation. It's not 90% God, 10% me. It's not you know, 99% God and 1% me. It's not 50, 50% God and 50% me. It is 100% by the grace of God. What does that word mean, grace? You've heard it all the time. We talk about it all the time. Grace means unmerited favor. It means that we don't deserve the favor he's going to give to us. It's a gift that he gives to us. This favor that he shines upon us is not by any work that we did, no earning. We didn't learn enough, we didn't get smart enough to understand something. It is 100% God doing all of the work. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man can boast, that no one may be able to boast about it. This is a, a concept, if you know Martin Luther, if you've heard of Martin Luther, um, in, in the 1500s, he started the Reformation. He decided to, he was a Catholic priest, but he started reading the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. And um, there, there's another verse, Romans 3.28, that, that explains the same thing. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. There had to be this distinction that Paul was teaching. And so Martin Luther, after he, he spent so many years as a Catholic priest, he started, for whatever reason, we believe that God through the Holy Spirit came on him and, and helped him understand these things more in a deeper way. And he said... This isn't right, what we're doing. And he, he started to, he wrote his 95 Theses about all these things that the Catholic Church was doing about works and works-based salvation, things, little acts that they had to do and um, all these different things that they had to do to earn their way out of, of, of certain uh, purgatory and, and to be made right with God, you know, the little rituals that had to be done and and, and Martin Luther said, no, I think we got this wrong. And he, he tried to reform the church. He tried to, to change it. And, um, and so he protested the church. And so if you've ever heard of pro Protestantism, that's, that's really what we are. We are Protestants. We are Protestant of a works-based faith. It's by faith alone, 100% God's work in all of this. We are Protestant Christians, that's, that's what happened in the Reformation, and that's why, you know, you see all these different denominations, because everybody started, you know, disagreeing on all these little things, and even today, you know, the church str struggles with unity, it always has, it always will, even though Paul, Paul, Jesus, and John, and everybody has said, no, you guys need to fight for unity, but there are some things that are worth fighting for and dying for, and this is one of them. When you have to decide to leave a church and change what you believe and repent, this is one of them. It's by faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. He does all the work. And so no matter who you are or what you've done, your eternity then is secure once you've placed your faith in Jesus. You know, I've sinned a lot in my life. And probably years ago, people would say, that guy's not going to heaven. <laughs> You know, maybe you felt that way in your own life. Maybe you say, you just don't know the things that I've done or the things that happened to me and I'm just so broken. I, I can't get out of this cycle of sin that I'm in. And some people think that they can out sin God's grace. But I'll tell you this, there is not one unforgivable sin other than 
unbelief. The only thing that makes it, makes it unforgivable in God's eyes is when you reject God, when you say, no, I don't believe in God. That is the one unforgivable sin. God's grace can reach far beyond any depth of sin or evil in this world, beyond all that we can imagine. The, the payment of Jesus Christ dying on the cross was a, sufficient to take care of the sins of all the entire world. We can't even fathom that. But the, the power of Christ on the cross can get rid of every sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. And so Paul himself, who was the author of Romans, he says in another book, he says, of, of sinners, I am the chief. I am the foremost sinner. I realize I've gone against God, but out of his grace, he saved me for a purpose. And we know that God used Paul. And this is, this is the thing that we need to understand about salvation. That's why this is in our pursuit. This is why we're, we're talking about it as a basic part of our faith. Because without understanding that it's, it's by faith we have eternal life, then we've got the wrong faith. Now there's another, you know, maybe controversial statement there is eternal security and I'll let you guys argue about that in your small groups or at home, you know. <laughs> but um, there are some verses that back this up. But first, I want to say, uh, Romans 3.22 says, We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for everyone, no matter who we are. Everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So this isn't like a white person's faith. This isn't a black person's faith. This isn't a Middle Eastern person's faith. This isn't a man's faith. This isn't a woman's faith. This is for everyone, all time. If you believe in Jesus, you can be united in the kingdom as a child of God, forgiven, set free, and going to heaven in his family. It goes beyond all borders, beyond all races, beyond all boundary lines. This is for everyone, no matter how far you've sinned, no matter what you've done in this life, even today, if you feel so guilty, Jesus Christ and the cross is here for you if you will place your faith in him and you can become a child of God. And then you can rest in the fact that, because here's the thing, people are like, okay, I place my faith in Jesus, but like, I keep falling in and out. I still don't know if I'm going to heaven because I'm struggling here, I'm struggling there. But the Bible says that we can know that we have eternal life. We don't have to worry anymore. We don't have to have that fear of death like I talked about earlier. Jesus in John 6, 39, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. The will of the Father is that he loses none of those that have been given to Christ Jesus. Again, he says, my, sh my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. That is an imperative. Like he's saying, this is what happens. True faith causes people to hear me, to know me, and they will follow me. And I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. Here's a verse in 1 John that I want you to memorize. And it, it says this, this is John later in life helping us to understand. You can have assurance of faith. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. This life is in his son. Here's the easy statement here. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Maybe you're here today. And you've wavered back and forth like, I don't know. I don't know if he loves me. I don't know if I've done things right. I don't know if I've followed him. My faith has been weak at times. That's okay. God's faith is greater than yours. He is faithful when you're not. But you can know, do you have the son? Do you believe in the son? Do you have the right information and the right attitude about yourself toward the son? You can know that you have eternal life. One way I memorized this, and I was taught this in, in, in a Bible school or a class that I went through, and it's, it's 1 John 5, 11, 12, 13. And so he would say, it's as easy as 1, 2, 3, or it's as easy as 11, 12, 13. If you're ever wondering, am I saved? 
It's as easy as 1 John 5, 1, 2, 3, or 11, 12, 13. Now, I know that's super weird, and your, your guys' brains probably don't think like mine does, so you're like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to remember that combination to get back to the assurance of faith. Maybe take a picture. I don't know, you know? But memorize this verse so you know that you have eternal life by faith alone in what Jesus has done. He's done 100% of the work for us. This is the last thing then. So this is how we start a relationship with God. There is no other way, no other possible way to start a relationship with God than by trusting in Jesus personally for salvation. And so how do, how do you do it? Maybe it's a mystical thing. Like, does it happen inside, in my mind, in my heart? Well, yeah, it does. It starts in your heart. Like, like we saw, they were cut to the heart. They wanted to repent. But then it turns into this outward, I got to do something about it. I got to say something. I got I to gotta do some kind of thing to show God that I, I love him and that I believe. And so this is as simple as it is in Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. So there is a confession part that happens. Like if we believe in Jesus, like we shouldn't be afraid to say that. Jesus is Lord. This is something that naturally will want to come out of you. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're saying, I, I, I affirm that. I want to say that. Well, one thing that I do when I'm discipling people or leading people to faith is I pray with them because that's just a, a natural way to help a person confess to the Lord and out loud and to hear themselves about what they believe about salvation. And so, so we, this is an example of something that I would pray with someone. This is a sinner's prayer. Now, before you read through all of that, I just want to you know, stop you guys right here and say, because this is, this is our close. And so I want to close this with praying. And if you're here today and, and some of those things that were said today didn't line up with your faith, but you feel a tugging at your heart, or maybe you've never trusted in Jesus before and you want to today. Maybe you're here and you felt like you've fallen away and you need assurance of faith again, or maybe you just want to pray corporately because you've been a Christian and you just want to see more people come to Jesus, then here's what I want to do is if, if this is, if, if that's any of you, if you feel the tug of your heart, the cut to your heart that you want to pray this, you can pray this with me and this can be the start of your journey of your relationship with God, of trusting in Jesus. So would everyone pray this with me and then I want to talk to you after if this is your first time ever doing it. Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. I know that you died on the cross and rose from the dead so that I could have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. I'm turning from my sin now and I'm turning to you in faith. I trust in you alone to forgive my sins and to give me new life. Thank you for this free gift. Amen. Mm -hmm.